You're wondering, hey, we finished up Ecclesiastes. What's next in our, our Sunday morning messages? We're going to continue to get into the Word of God, and our series is going to be entitled, Be Better. And if there's any hockey fans in there, that might be a little Boston Bruins, not Chicago Blackhawks. I know, I know, I know. I didn't design it, or else it would have been, you know. But uh, it doesn't stand for the Blackhawks, but... Uh, but we'll end up in Hebrews chapter number one here in a little bit. I received a text this past week from an old friend, and he was speaking to me through the text. Of, uh, he said, oh, boy, I've been meaning to get a hold of you. I needed to let you know how my son's doing in some things. And his son's a, a, an accomplished athlete, uh, still young. I've worked with him a little bit in baseball and, and pitching and things like that. And despite him being a, a on me and me having uh, some influence in him. Obviously, he's doing really well, so my influence has been minimized. I think that's a good thing. But he sent a report. Did I hear an amen over here somewhere? <laughs> and the email said, you know, I, I want to let you know he struck out 10 in five innings the other day in a game. Um, he didn't say that the other kids uh, were, uh, anyway, I won't say anything. So. They were all junior high kids, actually, and he's in high school. Just kidding. <laughs> and then he said that he pitched two innings on the weekend and struck out four, so he's doing really well. And uh, you'll know who this guy is when I, some of you might, I don't know, but so here's the end of the text. So. Still having a problem with the uh, speed difference between his fastball and his slider and his changeup. He really needs to work on that. I'm thinking, what? Five innings struck out 10. How many of you have ever struck out 10 in five innings? Oh, excuse me, Craig Lester's here. Oh, gosh. <laughs> that was really good. I like that. <laughs> that was good. That keeps it going. There's one of us here. Or strike out four in two innings. That's really a good job, but the text from dad is he needs to be better. You see, stuff like that is really often where, and I use this term a lot, where the ceiling is just put on our spirit life on our sanctification life in the Lord and the Word, is that I can never be better than I am now. I could never possibly be better in the Lord. I've learned everything. I've grown in every area. Uh, you know, basically, I, I just don't sit anymore. I don't know how anybody has problems with sin anymore. I, there's no way I could get any better. Now, obviously, that's none of us saying that. Maybe some other churches, I don't know. But, but to be perfectly straight up, all of us ought to be, we could consider that just having a better life or having something be better, or tomorrow I hope I have a better day. I've, I've had a stressed out day, I've had an anxious filled day, I've been very busy. I hope tomorrow's a better day. Some of you might say that. You might come home and, and, and talk to the wall or talk to whomever or not talk to anybody. You might scream and yell at the television. You might not even turn it on and say, Gosh, that was the worst day. I hope tomorrow is better. And again, this is familiar to you in terms of this idea that things have to get better. But I'm afraid and I'm concerned that our thinking about being better is only tied to the daily life dealing with the things of life other than the Lord Jesus Christ. What would be better well, to be better in the Lord and to allow the Lord to make you better, to say that I'd love to have Jesus Christ take tomorrow and make it even better in my life. In fact, beyond just the tomorrow circumstances and what's going to go on, I just want to be better in Jesus Christ. Now, you've heard me use this terminology a little bit. I use it a lot around here. And the, the staff and leadership know I, I really believe in the fact that the truth of Jesus Christ saying, Hey, and it was in one of the songs, if any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. 
Even the youth group had a, a camp theme of daily. And so you relate that to things and go, okay, I'm going to have to get in the backyard and work on this. I'm going to work on that. I'm going to be better. I'm going to be better. I'm going to be better. And we work on all these physical things. We work on these emotional areas. We work on these mental exercises. We work on our school. We work on everything. And then we'll find a way in which God maybe can give me a better day or I can be better in Jesus Christ. It all comes back to, again, what kind of disciple am I? What kind of follower of Jesus Christ am I? It says in Psalm 84, I said just to go there for a little bit of introduction, in verse number eight, the psalmist says, O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob, Selah. Behold, O God, our shield, and look upon the face of thine anointed. He is extolling God and his goodness. He is saying, please, I am humbled by you being in my life and watching over me. Now, please, please, I pray, Lord, my shield, look upon me, consider me. Verse number 10. What a great statement it here. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand I'd rather, I, I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Remember that old song, better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house than a thousand elsewhere. You see, today, to think about what would it be like to be better in the Lord would be if I just lived right there. If we would just live there and say, okay, okay, Lord, what would make things better in my life? If you could just get rid of this and get rid of this and get rid of this and get rid of this, no. But if you could just add this and add this and add this, how about if I just say, Lord, I just want to be holy as you are holy. I want to be healthier. I want to be holier. I want to be better. I've mentioned in a testimony a couple, two or three times that in 19, 2019, had a chance to go preach in Zambia, Africa. Why don't you go to Hebrews chapter number one with me while I'm just sharing this quick testimony that I have uh, before. And in that resurrection conference, preaching and speaking at different churches, uh, the last one that I spoke at was on Resurrection Sunday, and God just led me and directed me to a message out of Hebrews about better. And I titled it, Nothing is Better Than Jesus. And of course, when you're in Africa and you hear that song, there's no one, there's no one like Jesus, I mean, it's always sung, it's constantly sung. And it really captures the idea of, hey, a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I'd rather be the doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. I would rather just be the doorkeeper facing the elements of life and just watching over your courts than having the comfort of being in a tent that was of the wicked. I would rather just be manning your post, Father, wherever it may be. And if I have to go through whatever, that would be better than having to spend my time in a tent of the wicked. Jesus Christ is better. There is no one or nothing better than him. And here we are in a, a time of, hey, we finished up a book study in Ecclesiastes. I'm going to start another study uh, in the middle of May after we get through our uh, celebration, our 25th anniversary celebration. It is uh, only three weeks to Easter, two more to our 25th anniversary. Yeah. Where did all the time go? And so here we are in a short series, a topical series on Be Better. Of course, this topical series is surrounded and centered on the Lord Jesus Christ. Just when we had a little time around Christmas, a few messages, and we looked at his majesty, and we looked at the glory of his witness and, and all that that entailed. Well, today and for the next couple, two or three weeks, I just want to speak to you about what... It means to be better. Hebrews chapter number one, this is our flagship verse. We'll use this theme verse in verse number four, being made so much better than the angels as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Don't you love that phrase there? So much better. 
He is so much better. Jesus Christ is so much better. But let's grab verses 1, 2, and 3. We have read them in regards to Jesus more than one time. Nothing wrong. You can't miss with reading verses about Jesus Christ and his glory. And see what comes out of this. Again, Hebrews chapter number 1, verse number 1. It says, God, who at sundry times and divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. He hath, God hath, in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. God spoke sundry times, assorted times, divers, different manners. He spake in time past in different ways to the fathers by the prophets to get his message out, his calling out to the people. But of course, God moves things to make it even better. He says in verse number three, I'm going to do things, verse number two and three, I'm going to do things with my son, Jesus Christ, now. So these last days that we're living in, and it's the writing in this time, in this epistle, and of course in your King James Bible, it says the epistle of Paul, the apostle. I really do believe he is the author, though some do not, do not agree with that. But I believe it is a letter of Paul, and he is speaking and he is speaking to the Hebrews and generally saying, verse number three, about Jesus, his son, who, he, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Again, verse number four, being made so much better, so much better than the angels as he hath by inheritance obtain a more excellent name than they. All of God's people that are born again today, you know you're saved, you know you're a child of God, I'd just like to have you say amen. 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 So there's a lot of people there. Okay, so what he just wrote to you right there is this. My son Jesus... Practical application now, the context, of course, the epistle to the Hebrews, but practical for you and me, believers. Hey, church, he's saying, I made my son to be the one that everything would happen through now. I was ordained, he was ordained before the foundation of the world. He was slain, and I was going to send him one day. Now the time has come. And in him, everything is going to be better. He is so much better. Better than who? Better than everyone. Better than everything. There's nothing better than Jesus. Better than the angels. Better than all the little gods, the big ones, and all the others. He is bigger than anything. He is better than anything. He is over all. And here we sit as believers in the Lord, having a tough time getting better. And you're no different than me, and I'm no different than right here in the Bible. We're no different than the people that he's speaking to. So we don't come from a place of self-righteousness and the Pharisees, who we're going to cover here in a few minutes. We come from a place of, wow, thank you, God, for saving my soul. Thank you, God, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation, so rich and so free. And now I realize that it's better to be in your presence, in your court, than anywhere else. I realize that being better with you means that I need to be in your presence. But I realize that's really hard. Would you agree that it's hard to get better in the Lord? If it was easy, it wouldn't be worth anything. Because your salvation is worth everything. So that's why our simple title for our first message is, we have a challenge. Our challenge today is to be better. The series is Be Better for four or five weeks. But the statement today is, we got to put it right out there. This is our challenge. 
What's the challenge? Jesus is the model. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by him. I'm saved, born again. Okay, pastor, you keep on being redundant. What do I do now? Well, I have to really set myself apart unto the Lord and let him have his way. That seems pretty simple. I'll do that. How about if you do that every single day for the rest of your life? That's hard. There's the challenge. Welcome to the challenge that all of us have when we open up the Word of God and realize that he's writing the Word of God to you and me and everyone that's a lot like you and me. Because we can figure out how to make things better in a lot of areas. We want to fix up the house so we work on it, remodel it, and make it better. We want our diet to be better, so we work on that. We want our job to be better, so we work on that. We want our relationships to be better, so we work on that. Or so we say we're going to. We say we want to be better. So even in a general statement, I want to be better, but I don't want to pay the price that it's going to take to be better. Be better in the Lord Jesus Christ. That, that's like 10th down the list, Brownie. What, are you kidding me? No, it's first on the list. It's first. It's first. And all these things shall be added unto you if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Are we going to throw again the Sermon on the Mount out the door because it's in the Gospel of Matthew? No! Jesus is saying to every one of us, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Today, we realize that to be better means that. And everybody that's done that for a week or two or three or four or a month or two or like a couple of years or something, just say, God, I just want you to make me better and make me better. And I know today was not like the spirit-filled day I wanted it to be, but boy, I want to be better. I want to be better. I always want to be better in you. Would you do the work that you said you would do? Because you promised that you would keep me. I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nothing can separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Amen. I am confident in this very thing, that he that began a good work in you, he will complete it. He's going to finish the work. He's going to perfect it one day. And that will be the greatest be, back, be better ever when you're in his presence, when I'm in his presence. You know, the funny thing is about this whole idea of challenge to be better is that we just have to establish that in the Word of God. There's some thoughts about being better. And even our old friend Solomon had some thoughts on it. So let me just ask you this quick question. Do you consider the possibility that each day week, month, or year, with the Lord could be, maybe even ought to be better than the last. I mean, I've spoke about it for a few minutes now, but would you ask yourself that question? Do you consider the possibility? Oh, you're just, you know, you're just, you're just throwing something out there that's impossible. But then somebody will give you an impossible challenge at work and say, I'll pay you a $5,000 bonus, and you'll go, I can do that. There's no bonus money involved in this one. It's like the son communicate, the dad communicating to the son, you need to get better. Well, I, I pitched already seven innings. I struck out 14. How many did you strike out, dad? <laughs> Done pretty good. But the dad speaks as the father in heaven in the name of Jesus and says, you can be better. You can be better. How? By doing it again one more time and doing it again one more time and following the Lord one more day and following the Lord one more day. The be better sometimes is just simply saying each day, each week, each month, I'm going to allow you to be better in me because I want you, dear Lord Jesus, to be the one that I am to be better like. Solomon, of course, and all of his wisdom said a lot of neat things. Ooh, I put up there the wrong address. It should be Ecclesiastes chapter number seven. Go ahead and put it up there. Hey, I just noticed that. I went through first service and nobody threw anything at me. Ecclesiastes seven, this is a little bit from Solomon. I just wanted to give you a little something, a little segue from our Ecclesiastes study. Ecclesiastes seven, remember the title of that message, um, I think I entitled it uh, Right is Better Than Good because there was a lot of better things here. 
Verse number one in Ecclesiastes 7 says, a good name is better than precious ointment in the day of death than the day of one's birth. Verse number two, Ecclesiastes 7, it is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men, and live, living <coughs> excuse me, will lay it to his heart. Verse number three, Ecclesiastes 7, these all these betters. Now remember, what state Solomon's in when he's preaching this message in this particular text. He's basically saying that his great wisdom from God now has got this worldly wisdom twist. And of course, he still had the wisdom of the Lord, but now he's saying, wait a minute, this wisdom I'm going to show you in Ecclesiastes is the kind that breaks down on a daily basis sometimes. Now, verse number Two, sounds really good. It's good and it's a great principle. So that's got some great wisdom. It is better to go to the house of mourning. Verse number three, sorrow is better than laughter. And for the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. I can see that. Even Ecclesiastes 7, 5, it says, better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. Good stuff. But even for Solomon, our old buddy, out of Ecclesiastes and Proverbs, we know that his wisdom was flawed at this time of his life. And a lot of times, our wisdom is flawed. But it can come back to the point where you go, to be better means I really need to put the Lord first. Say, I know, I know, but would you be transparent with yourself? Would you just really look into your heart? Mark, look in here and find out if you really are saying, okay, I'll agree with Solomon at the end of Ecclesiastes 12. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Should I live there? Yeah, that would be a whole lot better to live there. And that would put me in a place where I could be better. Are you a better believer in the Lord Jesus Christ than you were a year ago? Two years ago? And the litmus test is the word of God. Does God have permission to walk up and down your heart, soul, mind, spirit and ask you, do you love me with all your heart, soul, mind and strength? Do you love your neighbor as yourself? Do you seek to please me? Because Solomon had neglected his relationship with the Father in heaven. And he had got to a point where the stuff that he said in Proverbs was no longer really his message of preaching. Maybe that is, again, a continuation of where we've been and how we look and say, God, can I just simply be better in you? I need to be better. And Jesus Christ is the one that is so much better. I ask you just a question for the believer I mentioned you earlier. Can life ever really be better without the Lord Jesus Christ? You're saved, you're born again. But can tomorrow really be better without putting him in it? Yeah, I'll get by. He'll, he'll give you a little something. Maybe give you some grace. And another day, and another day, and you keep Jesus out of it, and you keep Jesus out of it, and I keep Jesus out of it. You say, well, that's really hard to put Jesus back in it. I know. I'm speaking from experience. But I realize that for the believer, you and I, we, we cannot really be better. We can get some better moments, but we're not going to be better without the Lord Jesus Christ doing the work. So then the other side of the question on this, or the other side of the topic, uh, here's the other question is, for the non-believer, can life ever really be better without believing in the Lord Jesus Christ? If you are not a believer in Jesus today, if you never called on the name of the Lord to save you, if you are some way, somehow at a place of just a conflict of faith, let me just tell you that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Saved from what? From an eternity paying for your own sins. The Bible says without the shedding of blood is no remission. An Old Testament principle, sins had to be remitted, blood 
to take care of them. Sacrifice. A covenant has to have a sacrifice in order for it to be binding. So Jesus comes and says, I'm the better sacrifice. We'll get to that very soon in our study here in the next couple Sundays. I'm the better sacrifice. I'm the better covenant. I'm the better tabernacle. I'm the better. Well, praise the Lord. So that remission gets overtaken by the redemption of the Lord Jesus Christ by his blood. So believers, you know that. You've called on the name of the Lord to save you. But if you're lost, you're not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ as being the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come unto the Father but by him, that you've never put your faith and trust completely in him as Savior, then you've even looked at things and go, I just need to clean myself up, earn my way to heaven, and somehow I can do that. And the Bible says, no, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. When you put some of these things together, you go, wow, I guess there has to be a starting point. Yes, you have to admit that you have a need for Jesus Christ because you're a sinner. And the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ is our Lord. So what in the world am I gonna do with that? Well, the only way that I'm gonna get better is to call upon the name of the Lord to save me and let him make me better. What's the better in that moment? All of you can shout amen because that's when all your sins were washed away. And they were now as white as snow. That's the way the Lord sees you. For a believer, life can never, ever be really better without believing in Jesus Christ. So here's old Solomon's wisdom again as I ask you this question. Why has God's sanctified life of be better in Jesus been traded for some cheap facsimile of a better life found upon religious behavior. What happened to us? Why has God's sanctified life of be better in Jesus Christ been traded? We've got to stop making that trade. We're no different than the people that God addressed in this Bible. Colossians, Ephesians. Jesus Christ dealt with them all. The Pharisees replaced the beautiful covenant of Jesus Christ. They replaced God's beautiful message of faith with works and traditions and the law in fact, the Pharisees thought they were so awesome that they got the law down and then they added more to the law and they said, hey, I got something better and that's my religious behavior that's gonna just flood away. Beautiful grace of God. Eh, you lose. Believers, guess what? Bound from heaven, nothing can separate you from the love of God. You are spiritually circumcised, but how is it that you've decided and we've decided just to say, ah, being better in Jesus Christ isn't going to be any good. Oh, let me just tell you as we finish here in a little bit, you're going to see how Jesus Christ shows you the challenge. And the challenge to be better is because there's an incredible warning out here. And the warning is there are people on the other side of the battle. They are the devil's emissaries, and they do not want you to tell people about Jesus Christ. They don't want more people to get saved. They are demons and devils, and there are people that are working for that side. They're false prophets. They're Pharisees. They're Sadducees. They're scribes. They're religious people that say, hey, I got a better gospel for you. Eh, wrong. You see, the whole picture here of God showing us what's better is really simple, and it is found in the book of Proverbs. Again, in Solomon's good, good times, I'll just put two or three up here for you. Then I'll put, just leave you a list and a slide while I transition into the other part of our message is this introduction gets you to a place of thinking, be friend. Excuse me, be better. You need to see this. How much better is it to get wisdom than gold and to get understanding rather to be chosen than silver? We know Solomon knew so much about wisdom. He said wisdom is better it is better so much more than gold. Understanding is better than 
to be chosen than silver. Proverbs 16, 19 says, it is better to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Isn't it better to have that Jesus type of humble spirit? Because he's the one that can give it to you. Jesus can give you the idea that wisdom is better than gold. Gold is so much better to us when we are in a religious place. I can do so much more if I just had more money. But when I get the idea of being better in Jesus Christ, I see things totally different. It says in Proverbs 16, 32, he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his city than he that taketh a city. Isn't it better to be slow to anger? Isn't it better to find wisdom? Isn't it better... As the list of those Proverbs are up on the screen, you go, it is better. I just put a whole list of Proverbs up there so you can write them down. You say, well, why don't you just write the numbers? I just thought I'd mess with you a little bit and make you pay attention. Hopefully you did. You don't have to write Proverbs every time, by the way. It's okay. Or if you want to, you can. But Proverbs 8, 11, I'll read it for you real quick. For wisdom is better than rubies, and all, thing, all the things that may be desired are not to be compared to it. Who gives you that thinking process unless it's Jesus Christ? Because in your flesh, rubies are better than everything. My flesh wants more gold. Be better. It comes from Jesus Christ and the life of Christ. We again are to be predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. That's what he wants from the moment of your salvation. He says, I've got you. When you by free will call the name of the Lord to save you, from that point, you are mine. If you'd allow me permission, I will make you like my son. That's what he desires to do. Proverbs 15, 16 says, Better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. Wow, gosh, better is little with the fear of the Lord. That's from a God perspective, from a Jesus life, from a word of God perspective, from the Holy Spirit working in you. That's a better life, I promise you it. The the Bible's not lying to us. Here's three quick ones right there. I'll read them. Proverbs 21, it is better to dwell in the corner of a housetop than with a brawling woman in a wide house. It is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and an angry woman. It is better to dwell in the corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman in a wide house. For all you husbands that are sitting there going, yeah, thanks, Pastor, for putting me in a good spot, man. Thank you. I really appreciate that. <laughs> the message is be better. That just says it's better to. It doesn't mean you cancel out what's wrong in your life. Jesus will make you better in order for you to handle such a thing. You see, it comes back to Jesus Christ. It comes back to being better. Great, great words from Solomon. You think the Old Testament has a lot to say? It does. The Old Testament is just lined with all of that kind of statement that points us to the Lord Jesus Christ. It points us, of course, to the King of Kings, the Messiah. It tells us, hey, I can make you better every day. You can be better every day. Well, guess what? The New Testament tells us also, too, there's the same thing before us, but the challenge, just like in the Old Testament, exists today. I can't... These guys, they don't know how tough it is to live for Jesus now. To be better now, well, I think that you have over-exaggerated the life that you live and the time you live in as being so much more. Look in the Bible. It's been, it's always been God's way or my way. It's always been God's way or the devil's way. God's way says, hey, it's going to be a challenge, but I will make you better. There are warnings in the New Testament that give us a point where we can say, hey, I can see this as a challenge to be better. I got that. It says in Philippians chapter number three, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. Philippians 3, 2, beware, beware, beware. The New Testament tells us to beware. It's a challenge to be better. Colossians 2.8, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. That's the verse right after the investor's theme verses. 
You see, you've got to understand that if discipleship does not take root, this is what happens. Second Peter chapter number three, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to him be glory, both now and forever, amen. But what it says before that, many of you know that, ye therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before, beware lest ye also, which means Peter understood, and he's saying ye also, like you too, like me too, understand what happens when I'm led away with the error of the wicked and I fall from my own steadfastness. It happened in Peter's life. Are you willing to be better? Are you committed to being better with Jesus Christ? Or have you just basically given yourself a pass? As we finished out Ecclesiastes last week, the challenge from our guy Solomon was really a godly challenge. And he basically was saying this, as it says up there, be better. He's saying here, fear God, keep his commandments. The whole duty of man, that's the way you're going to be better. Well, Solomon at least gave us a little bit of a recognition of what it's like to have the right kind of life. And it does go back to Hebrews chapter number one. And it does put us in that place Put up verse number four for me, would you please? Just to be reminded that Jesus being made so much better than the angels. So much better, so much better, so much better. But there is a challenge, again, for us to be better. And so, just for the next few minutes, just setting some groundwork for this, I want you to see three simple things. They're really just really simple, but they're yet powerful of Jesus Christ saying... I know the challenge is before you. I want you to be better. So disciples, I'm gonna show you the challenge and what you need to be aware of. Because if you are not aware of what's going on around you, or you are not allowing me to work in you, to be more of you, and for you to be less of you, then the challenge will just go right past you. You see, to be better means that it's one who is above another rank to be better, to be more favorable in a condition or a position, to be in a place where you've exceeded where you were before, where you eclipse something before. Don't you want to be better in the Lord Jesus Christ? Not better in your paycheck, not better in, oh gosh, I just, I, everybody loves me at the, a job because I do such a great job. No, to be better. And Jesus Christ himself warned us about the teaching of the Pharisees and said, hey, You Pharisees, you've peddled such an awful mess here, and so many of us still to this day, 2,000 years later, are still buying in to this Pharisaical way of living. It doesn't work. Unless you want to be kind of like unbetter, and you want to be worse. See, the flesh is going to battle and war against you all the time. Yes, 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 yes. But in order for me to be better, in order for me to get better one day, another day, another day, another day, I have to apply what the Word of God says. Well, in order to apply it, I need to open it up. I need to see what God wants me to do. I need to say, Jesus, how in the world do I do this? Well, let me warn you about one area that's going to make it tough. It's the pharisaical teaching of the times that we live in. Oh, the same times there? Yeah, almost 2,000 years ago. He's warning them the same Pharisees who peddled a man-pleasing life of religion and empty worship. Here's your first challenge, to be better. The first challenge arises when we are faced with false prophets that proclaim a false gospel. That means we must proclaim the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, he's gonna leave that slide up. If you want to write that one down, that's fine. Go with me to Matthew 7. Matthew chapter number seven. Watch Jesus show you and me the real challenge of being better and how, being alerted to it, that we can turn this thing around, that we can confront this matter in our lives and say, God, I must learn how to be better and proclaim the true gospel of Jesus Christ because there are so many gospels going out there right now, so many false prophets that proclaim a gospel. There may be a few of you in here right now. You're proclaiming your gospel, your way, your truth, your life. You say, I would never do that. You gotta check yourself because the pharisaical way is 
You'll have a better life if you receive Jesus Christ. Sorry. That's not what the gospel teaches. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. The spirit birth is what saves your soul. Your soul is damned to hell if it leaves this earth and you've never believed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible's very, very clear. There is a bunch of false prophets out there saying, ah, you know what? I know your life is really rough. If you just put your trust in the Lord, it's going to be better. Whoa! I'm tired of hearing that. I'm just telling you, I'm tired of hearing it. It goes on the college campuses all day long. And young people are believing, oh, I don't have to give my life to Christ and call on the name of the Lord to save me? I don't need to repent of my wicked, rotten sin and call on the name of the Lord to save me? And then people are walking around going, well, do I grab Calvinism? Do I grab Armenianism? Do I grab Jehovah Witness? Do I grab Mormons? What do I grab? Are we not going to get to a place where we proclaim the truth of the gospel? We've got to. I told people at first service, I can walk on a college campus. I am honored that I can go certain places, but you can go certain places that I can't go and talk to 18, 19, 20-year-olds. They are just so mixed up by the stuff they're being told. They really are. But let me just tell you this. Have a heart for them. They want to hear the truth. They don't want to be lied to anymore. Do you want to be lied to? That means we're no different. They're no different. I love being in a youth group and everybody go pick up those teenagers. They don't know how to act. They always act out in church. Have you ever watched yourself act out in church? At least one person agrees with me they left. Because they know. I won't tell you all the people that said that, Kayla. I'll protect your girl. Here's the point. We as believers are challenged to be better. And Jesus makes us aware of one of the challenges. I'll give you this one in chapter 7, verse 13. I'll skip one and go to the end here in a minute for time. Watch this. Enter ye in the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go and retreat. And go in there, go in there at. Verse number 14, Matthew 7. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware. Verse number 15, it's up on the screen. Beware of the false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs or thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. Think of what I said earlier. The challenge to be better arises when you're faced with false prophets that proclaim a false gospel. The only way you're going to walk through that is for you to have the true gospel and tell the truth to people. Jesus is the only way. Tell your children. Tell your grandchildren. Tell them. Show them. Be better for them and than you were before because Jesus is making you better. It's good to be a grandpa because you get brokenhearted over what you didn't do right before and you need to do something about it. You need to do something. And the thing is to give God permission to make you better in Jesus Christ. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit in verse 18, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruit ye shall know them. Woo. There's a self-deception going on for the church. We're deceiving ourselves. We're acting like Pharisees and scribes. I speak of myself. We're self-righteous. We're self-sufficient. The Pharisees held to their own interpretation of the law. They held to the traditions even when it conflicted with the law. And they never let go of their traditions. The scribes were the secretaries of the Old Testament and the kings. That's the way they operated. But as time went on, they were also copied the scriptures. They were interpreters of the scriptures. And yet, you know what they did? They held to such the letter of the law that they didn't know the spirit of the law behind it that wrote it. 
and that was holy God with love. I'll skip the next one and go to the last one as God is challenging us. Our challenge to be a better arises when we're faced with the religious that's supposed to be people that teach corrupted doctrine. Here's a good one for you. We must teach doctrine with grace and truth of Jesus Christ. Remember? The law came by Moses, grace and truth by Jesus. We need to follow his model. Go to Matthew 16. We'll keep that slide up there. Go to Matthew 16. These guys and the disciples are just like you and me. The disciples had a difficulty like you and me in that they heard something once, they heard something again, they heard something again, and it took them a couple times. <sighs> they got it, they got it. But sometimes they didn't get it. And so the disciples, they needed Jesus Christ to explain things to them. That's okay. That's what makes you better. If you ask him to give you some understanding by the Holy Spirit. Matthew 16 Verse number one, it says that the Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. I love this answer. <laughs> Jesus answered them, said unto them, when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be fall weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. Oh, ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the time. It's getting near the end, boys. He's telling them it's getting near the end. It's getting near the end. You can't even figure out the times. I'm speaking to you right in front of you. I'm bringing you truth. And you hypocrites are more concerned about how I can show you a sign or a wonder from regarding the weather. Here's how it goes in verse number five. Excuse me, verse number four. A wicked, adulterous nation... I mean, generations seek after a sign, and there no sign be given unto it, the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. So Jesus is away. And when his disciples are come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. By the way, isn't that fun? The disciples forget bread all the time. I don't know. Is there any type of theological thing on that? Somebody send me an email. I don't know. I know there's a lot there. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, another classic example, saying, talking to themselves, they didn't ask Jesus, It is because we have taken no bread. When Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves because ye have brought no bread? Why don't you ask me what I mean? That's me, I put that in there. Verse number nine, Do ye not understand... Yet understand, neither remember the five loaves of the 5,000, the baskets you took up, the seven loaves of the 4,000. How many? Didn't you know the bread is not the issue? The physical food is not the issue? Verse number 11. How is it that you don't understand that I spake it not to you concerning the bread, but ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Question mark. Verse 12. Here it is. Then understood they how that he bade them not. Beware of the leaven of bread because, be, excuse me, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Whew. False doctrine everywhere. Everywhere you look. Oh, it's just a sign of the times. It was going on there too. 2,000 years ago, and 1,000 years before that, and 1,000 years before that. People have been messing with God's straight truth for so long. That challenge says up there to be better. It arises when you're faced with the religious people that teach corrupted doctrine. We must teach doctrine with the grace and truth of Jesus Christ. You're going to have to go after it. There is a Bible institute for you that's at a very high level, all the way down to the place where you can go to a Bible study on Sunday mornings. You can come to a Bible study if you're a young single person on Tuesdays. You can come to an older, or anybody can come to a Wednesday night Bible study that Pastor Bobby's teaching out there in the coffee house. There is men's stuff, there is women's stuff, and then there is a big thing for us, one-by-one -one discipleship. You can learn the Bible with someone one-on-one, -on -one, two two-on-two. Just call the office and ask. I don't know how to answer people that are teaching false doctrine. You no longer have to live in that place anymore if you would just say, yes, 
please, I want to be better. Is there someone there that can teach me how to be better? In Jesus. Not be better so you're the next school teacher here, which if God allows you, praise the Lord. How about if you just say, I just want to learn. I just want to grow. I just want to be better in Jesus Christ. I end with us going to the Lord's Supper with this. As the church, we are the church, we come to worship together in the Lord's Supper. What is our level of commitment? What's your level of commitment today? You're going to partake in the Lord's Supper. The Bible says to examine yourself. Remember what Jesus Christ has done. We take part in this. It's a communing time together as we come to worship. So what is your level of commitment to be better? This is a piece collectively of being better in the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you please bow your heads for a word of prayer? My brother is going to be playing some music right now in the background. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to come up and get our elements for the Lord's Supper, and we're going to go ahead and, and partake in the sweet time of worship. Our Father in heaven, thank you for our sweet time that you have given us as we have turned it all over to you. Father, we want to be better in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It starts with salvation, and I thank you. I thank you for giving your salvation so rich and so free. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross, being buried in a borrowed tomb and raising in the third day. Thank you, Jesus, for being the author and finisher of our faith. Thank you, Jesus, for laying down everything and giving your all. And now, by the word of God and by the spirit of God, we want to be better, Jesus, we want to be better in you, for you, through you, with you. I pray that for our church. I pray that for my friends, my brothers and sisters, all those here today. I pray that for them. And now as we come to the Lord's Supper, God, make this a very special time by you really truly meeting with us. And as people commune with you, may it be a time where we get our hearts right. In Jesus' name, amen.